uh, I've been at the RSA for 11 years and um, being reminded there that if you join the RSA, you become a fellow, uh, it reminds me of my very first meeting at the RSA. Um, and I had come from working in Downing Street. Uh, and the RSA was a slightly sleepy organisation then. And uh, also, I can be insufferably arrogant as a person, as you'll find out over the next 30 minutes. Um, <laughs> so I, I went into the first meeting of the staff and thinking the organisation was a bit sleepy and thinking that I was cleverer than everybody. Uh, I said that one of the reforms I wanted to instigate straight away was that I thought that the fact that when people joined the RSA they became a fellow was sexist and that it was more egalitarian and inclusive if we were to say that if you joined the RSA you became a member. And I was rather pleased to myself that I was going to reform things so radically right at the beginning. It wasn't until I was wandering up to my office that a rather junior member of staff came up to me, introduced themselves and said it's fantastic to have you as chief executive. We loved your idea. There's just one small worry that we have. And I said, what's that? And she said, are you absolutely sure that people are going to, going to want the letters MRSA uh, <laughs> after, <laughs> after their name? So um, really, it's been a kind of, it's been a kind of 11 year recovery process uh, from having made a complete idiot of myself at the very first meeting. Now, there's something slightly odd about the conversation we're about to have because um, Normally, and I talk in quite a lot of different venues and places, uh, I will talk to an audience uh, and I will hope that a journalist might be there who might find what I'm saying sufficiently interesting to put it in a newspaper. Uh, but it doesn't really happen very much. So I speak to audiences and I'm already losing people, which is <laughs> not, uh, not a great start, but anyway, it's fine. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I speak to audiences and it's of no interest. If there is a journalist in the room, they go, and they're off. Now today I find myself in this bizarre position. Are any of you journalists? No, you see, the thing is, <laughs> if you were journalists, you'd be really interested in what I'm going to say to you. So it's kind of odd, really, that I have something of incredible news value to talk to you about, and none of you are bloody journalists. So... Uh, <laughs> That's just the way it is. I've been up half the night because, um, and I'm going to talk to you about this, because I'm about to publish a piece of work that the Prime Minister asked me to undertake uh, last October. And uh, having had a very careful media strategy of working with journalists who have been involved in the process as we've gone around the country talking about our work and uh, pointing them in the direction of some of the debates we've had and encouraging them to report some of the issues that might be in the review. And I've done it very carefully and very subtly and it's generated some really interesting articles. And then yesterday on the train I got a phone call from a rather hostile journalist saying someone's given me your report. Like, the whole thing. So, uh, anyway, I've been involved in damage li limitation and um, it's uh, all over the Times today and it's not actually the report, it's a version of it from a month or so ago and it's not the whole report, it's just an extract. But anyway, it's a pain to be quite honest. So, um, at the moment there's quite a lot of media interest in what I'm going to say next week. So, um, I'll talk to you a bit about that, but I want, if I, if I might, to uh, reflect first on... Um, the question of change, because what we're talking about, uh, what I'm talking about over the next 20-25 minutes is work, and the work that I do, the work that I've always done really, uh, is the work of trying to achieve social change. Um, I think, uh, I'm what's I think commonly called a busybody, basically, that's what I am. I kind of try to interfere in people's lives and make them better. I don't know what right I've got to want to do that, but it's my vocation, I guess. Um, so social change is what uh, I try to do and I've tried to do it as a campaigner and a protester and as a political activist and as a think tank director and as an insider, special advisor to the Prime Minister and now uh, at the RSA. So I think a lot about change. And the conclusion I come to, being old and battered, looking back over um, kind of 35 years of, in various ways, trying to achieve change, um, is that it's bloody difficult. 
You know, that's basically my top line uh, thing to share with you. Any of you thinking of embarking upon a life of social change, I want to say to you, consider a, ca a career on the stage. Um, uh, you might get paid less, uh, but you'll be more in control. Um, so why is it hard? Um, I think it's hard for, for two reasons, two different reasons. Firstly, and you'll recognise this, I'm sure, it's hard because of the work of getting the balance right between um, articulating and building a different world and achieving change in the world in which we actually live. Right? So that's the kind of idealism, visionary work of change and then the grinding, tough, building alliances, winning support, developing policies side of it. The visionary stuff, the technocratic stuff. And getting that balance right is incredibly difficult, but yet you have to try to put these things together. To be realists, we must first be visionaries, in my view. Um, so that's the first reason it's difficult. And you can see people and hear people, and they're inspiring, and they have a fantastic vision. But you do quietly think to yourself, that's great, talking to us, because we all agree with you, but how on earth is that ever going to change anything? And then you hear other people who, who seem to know all the data, and they're very technocratic, and they know how to get things in newspapers, but it's all a bit dry. It doesn't really seem to be shifting anything. It doesn't seem to be of the scale of change that we need in a context like this, when we're talking about the need for fundamental shifts in people's values and the way in which they live. So that's the first reason it's difficult. The second reason it's difficult is um, because, generally speaking, when we try to do it, we fail. And that's not just true of public policy, which is mainly what I do, but it's also true of social innovation. I don't know if any of you are involved in social innovation. Uh, and it's even true of organisational change. Now, the thing about public policy, social innovation, organisational change, is they're all ways of trying to do something Difficult, and the thing they're trying to do is to change the way people think and behave. That's ultimately what they're trying to do. That, that's what they're about. And they're trying to change the way that people think and behave in a way that lasts. And I can tell you, because this is my world, that generally speaking, if the goal is to shift the way people think and behave in a way that lasts, 99% of the time it doesn't, we don't achieve what we want to achieve. And... Um, it's true of public policy. Sometimes public policy fails catastrophically, and it's always rather amusing when it does. You know, I give you the poll tax, uh, the London Underground Public-Private Partnership, the Child Support Agency, Universal Credit, up to now, um, and all sorts of things like that. You know, electronic patient records, just nightmares, horror stories of failure. But generally speaking, public policy fails in a more humdrum way. What happens is people take an initiative, they try to make a change happen, it has an impact while your foot's on the accelerator, while you're putting money into it, why it's a priority, but the second you stop putting money into it, it stops being a priority, you turn around and, oh no, things have gone back to how they were before. Social innovation, it sometimes works when the pioneers are trying to do it, it's great, and then everyone says, oh, that worked, it was brilliant, that thing you did in Stroud was great, let's do it. In Grimsby, oh, it doesn't work, and it doesn't work because it worked when someone was inspired by it and they created it and they threw their life into it, but when you pick it up and you put it in a toolkit and you give it to someone else and you say, you do it, it just does not work, and quite often it doesn't work because nothing works in two very different kinds of places. An organisation, have any of you ever been in organisations that have gone through organisational change processes? It's an absolute nightmare. Um, and everyone gets very excited, you go to all the meetings and the coaches are there and the organisational consultants are there and it's all fantastic and everyone gets very involved and then about 18 months after it's happened we're all down the pub on a Friday night complaining about the boss just like we were before. Mm. And if you're all the boss, that's the worst because you're not even invited. Um, so, um, w w why is there that level of failure? Um, I, I, I've thought about it deeply and in the end I, 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 I think there are two, two reasons why things fail. And I'm going to come back to talk about work in, in one minute, I promise you. But um, there are two reasons why things fail, overwhelmingly. The first is that when we try to make change happen, we're too scattergun. We try to change, change one part of a system. We pull one lever. We try to address one thing. When actually most things that hold people's behaviour and attitudes in place are systemic. They're complex. And so we try to pull that, we change that one thing. It doesn't have the effect, or very often worse, it has a completely unpredictable, unexpected effect, not the effect we wanted at all. 
and we keep pulling at it and it doesn't make much difference. The other thing that happens, the other reason, so that kind of scattergun problem is the first problem. The second problem is what I would call path dependency. And what I mean by that is that if you're trying to win a mandate for change, so you're trying to win, you're trying to persuade a politician to back a policy or an investor to invest in a social innovation or a chief executive or a board to support an organisational change, it takes a long time and a lot of effort. It takes years quite often. And in that process, in order to convince them to invest in your idea or support your idea, invest in capital of one kind or another in your idea, you have to say that you're absolutely right. It's no good saying to them, I think I might be right. I'm not sure, but, you know, take a bit of a chance. When was the last time you had a politician on the Today programme say, my policy, probably going to work. Not sure. <laughs> not sure. There's quite a lot of downside, you know. No. So you have to say it's going to work, it's going to be perfect. And so what happens is you embark upon your change and then, of course, complex, difficult reality, difficult people. Within a few weeks, it's not really going in the way that you thought it was going. What you ought to do, of course, is go back to whoever's sponsoring the change and say, oh, it's not quite what... Can we just shift? Can we turn... Can we do... But we don't. A lot of the time, we just plough on and we really hope it's going to work out well in the end. And we spend a lot of time looking at the data to try and find evidence that it's really working after all. So we at the RSA, and this is the last thing I'll say before I talk about work, uh, we have this bit of jargon that we use to describe the way in which we think people, organisations, political movements should go about change. Now, it is a bit of jargon, and I have to apologise to you for the fact that I do use jargon. I, was, uh, I did a sociology degree, and if you do a sociology degree, one of the things you're taught is to use language as impenetrable as possible. That is a professional... <laughs> Uh, I'm sure you've heard the old joke, what do you get when you cross a sociologist, a member of the Mafia? And the answer is someone who makes you an offer you can't understand. Um, <laughs> so what we say at the RSA is we say the way to think about change is to think like a system and act like an entrepreneur. So we say the way to think about change is analyse a system, think systemically, imagine how that whole system could be different, and that is patient and it takes time and it's difficult, but act in a completely different way, act in a really opportunistic, agile, entrepreneurial kind of way. Moving quickly, if things fail, pull back, try small things. Don't look at a system and say, what is the change we want? Look at a system and say, where could change be possible? Where might change come from? And one of the reasons you have to think like that is because of the nature of rea our reality, because there is an interesting paradox about the world in which we live, and the paradox is this. On the one hand, we have never known more about stuff than we know now. So if you're a policy analyst or a strategist, my word, the amount of data you've got now in comparison to how people were 20 years ago, you've got data coming out of your ears, especially if you're in Google, but you've got unbelievable amounts of data uh, analysing things in real time. And when people made policy 20 years ago, they had to wait years for information to be available. Now it's like this. So we know all this stuff. So we can look at systems in a much richer way than we were able to before, in real time ways. So that's, but on the other hand, in this world where we know more and more and more, we also seem to be more and more in the hands of contingency, of completely unexpected events, which seem to transform the world. And when I say unexpected, I mean really unexpected events. So we've had two recently. We've had Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, and, you know, Jeremy Corbyn is a highly successful politician. He's favourite to be the next Prime Minister. He campaigned brilliantly. But there's no question that part, part of Jeremy Corbyn's success was because he was so unsuccessful before. Because he was so unsuccessful before, Theresa May thought she could call an election and didn't have to have a debate and could have unpopular policies in her manifesto, popular policies that upset older people who are conservative voters. And so I, I don't know. Jeremy Corbyn may be a genius. He's certainly very effective. But I don't think he was deliberately bad in order to lull the Conservatives into a false sense of security, <laughs> in order to then become really good. I think it was contingency. And then much more tragically, of course, we've had Grenfell Tower. You know, and the point about these things, Corbyn, Grenfell Tower, is that nothing will be the same again. This is a moment of social transition. You know, we will never be able to talk about politics in Britain in, you know, for the next hundred years without talking about Jeremy Corbyn in the campaign, regardless even if he becomes Prime Minister. That will be a key moment. I hope we'll never be able to talk about social housing, urban inequality, austerity, without talking about Grenfell Tower and the moment that was. So we live in this world where we know all this stuff, but yet we're in the grips of contingency, and that's why we need to think systemically and act entrepreneurially. Now, let me, in the second half of what I have to say, 
but it won't last as long as the first half. Uh, and the second half of what I have to say, let me talk about what that has meant for the piece of work I've done about work. Because I wouldn't have much credibility uh, pacing around in front of you if I was talking about thinking and acting like that and not actually doing it myself. So when I got a phone call from someone who worked for Theresa May but doesn't work for Theresa May anymore, and that's quite a large uh, group of people, they could, uh, <laughs> they could potentially have a festival of their own. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I'd go, but uh, uh, anyway, when th the person who worked for Theresa May doesn't work for anymore contacted me and said the Prime Minister would like you to undertake this review, I was excited because if you do public policy, being asked by a Prime Minister, any Prime Minister, to do a piece of work about something that matters, and in my case it was work, is exciting. But I also knew something else, which is this. I don't know how many of you have been around Westminster, but if you've been around Westminster, there's a graveyard. It's hidden away. I don't, never actually found it myself, but I know it's there, and it's the graveyard of independent commissions, which have, you know, all over, the, undertaken by people much cleverer than me, with much more secretarial support than I've had, you know, much more research, brilliant pieces of work, now buried in unmarked graves, and nobody can even remember them. The Tomlinson Review of Post-16 Education, the Lions Review of Local Government Finance, they're just two of the biggest ones I can remember, but like, and I didn't want that to happen to me. So, armed with what I've said to you about change, and thinking that I don't want my review to be buried in that, unmarked, on one of those unmarked graves, I. I thought hard about this, and so what I've done is this, and you will find out at the beginning of next week, I, I can't even tell you exactly what day in case it changes, but it will be early next week, um, you'll find out to a certain extent whether I've succeeded. So that's quite unusual, isn't it, to have a speaker who, who says something, and you'll know within three days whether they were talking nonsense or not, you know. So um, uh, th I was kind of asked to look particularly at gig work, so that was what the media thought I was being asked to do, to look at Uber, Deliveroo, things like that. How do we respond to these new business models? But I decided very early on that thinking about vision and practicality, thinking about system and being opportunistic, that I had to do it differently. So what I did very early on in the process was I said, no, this review isn't really about gig work. That's part of what we're looking at. It's actually about a much broader issue, and the broader issue is the quality of work in our country. And so I kind of redefined my remit and said it's about good work. And I started to make an argument, which is that actually as a country, we're pretty good at creating jobs. Um, if, you, you know, if we had the same rate of employment as Italy, we'd have six million fewer people working in this country. So we're pretty good at creating jobs, and we're pretty good at creating flexible jobs. And most people who work flexibly want to work flexibly. So quantity, we're not bad. You know, we've got lots of problems in our economy, but... Creating work isn't really one of them. The problem is the quality of the, that work. And uh, what I started to argue was that we need to say that the quality of work that people do matters as much as the quantity of work that we generate. And I argued that for a number of reasons. I argued it firstly because there will, for the foreseeable future, be people in this country who work and don't get paid a lot. They find it hard to make ends meet. And it seems to me that our social contract to those people should be that if we can't guarantee you that when you work, you will have a decent standard of living, we should at least be able to say to you that you will have dignity at work and that you will be able to have the opportunity to progress at work, to move on to a better job across your career. Secondly, good work matters because it's important to our health and well-being. Bad work, exploitative work, controlling work, insecure work, is bad for our health and well-being, and that means that's bad not just for, the, for individuals, but it has knock-on effects for wider society. Thirdly, bad work is bad for productivity, which is something that is bad about the British economy. Now, for those of you who are very kind of environmentally minded, you might say, well, productivity is a bit of a dodgy concept, so I'm not even sure about economic growth. But the fact of the matter is you want a productive economy, even if you don't want a growing economy, because a productive economy is a plate will create the possibility of more leisure. It creates the possibility of it being easier to raise enough money to pay for welfare and public services. So we do want productivity, even if we have different ideas about, about growth. Um, fourthly, we should want good work because w we say this about citizens, ab about you in civil society. We say we want citizens who are active and engaged and who vote and who speak out and, to coin a phrase you might remember, take back control. But yet, we still have an attitude which is that stops at the door of the factory and the door of the office. And when you're, in gov when you're in work, it's like private government. You are told what to do by people who aren't elected. And 
We ought, in my view, if we have that view of active, responsible, trusted citizenship, we should want that same view in the workplace. And then finally, the robots are coming. Now, I don't subscribe to the kind of more outlandish ideas that in, you know, 15 years you'll all be replaced by an algorithm. Now, I'll be an algorithm, you'll be an algorithm, and there'll just be an algorithm. Uh, I don't really believe that. I think that, you know, what will happen is that tasks will change, the labour market will change, new business models will emerge. Remember, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, everyone said the music industry was dead because of online streaming. It turned out what happened was that a lot more people listened to music a lot more of the time and that live music massively grew. So we've no idea what's going to happen, really. But there is certainly going to be a lot of change, and robotics and AI, machine learning are going to be part of that. And it's really important, it seems to me, when we think about technological change, that we do that with good work in mind, that the goal is of using machines is to take the bad bits of work, the drudgery, the danger out of work and leave us with the stuff we want to do, which is the creative stuff, the caring stuff, the, emotion, the, the stuff that is about human connection. So I've, I've made the argument. I've made the argument for good work. And I've taken that argument around the country. So at the beginning of next week, uh, what you'll see when my review is published is this. Are there still no journalists in the room? That's good. You'll all be on Twitter, of course. But yeah. What you'll see is a, is a report that's got three levels to it. You'll see a report that has, as I was asked to do, some specific recommendations about work, and particularly about people at the bottom end of the labour market. So there'll be specific recommendations about protecting people from exploitation, about being clearer about when people are self-employed or employed, and about how it is we enforce people's rights. So there'll be all that stuff, concrete material stuff that I hope the government will implement as soon as they can, although it won't be easy because of Brexit. The second level will be a set of systemic things, things which I say we need to address over the next 10 years. I can't define how we do it. It'll be an emergent process, but there are issues like tax and the way we treat self-employed people, like employability, like having an industrial strategy that isn't just about high-tech, high-export stuff, but is also about low-paid, low-skilled workers. So there's a set of shifts there, and I say to the government, this is the direction you need to go in, and I don't know exactly how, what the route is, but set the direction, and then start a conversation, and try to build legitimacy for action amongst the population and amongst stakeholders. And then finally, there will be a call for good work, and so the top line of my review will be that we should set the ambition that every job in our economy Every job is fair and decent with scope for fulfilment and development. And as part of this process, I you know I was talking about acting like an entrepreneur, <coughs> being opportunistic. <coughs> I did something rather odd a few weeks ago, and I can promise you no one has ever, er, ever done this before. Right? I run the RSA, so, you know, it's my gaff. I can do what I like with it. I mean, it's not really true, but anyway. Uh, I can occasionally get initiatives going in the RSA. So what I decided to do a few weeks ago was I started a campaign. I, I basically used the RSA to run a campaign to persuade me to do something I wanted to do already. So uh, I used my annual lecture to launch a campaign called Good Work Is, which was you know, pretty successful. Thousands of people contacted us and talked about what they thought good work is and try to raise the profile of that issue of good work ahead of uh, our launch next week. And of course, what we found out about what people value in work was interesting because it was so remarkably consistent. And so, of course, pay, basic conditions matter to people, and they particularly matter to people who find it hard to make ends meet. But beyond pay and conditions, what you find matters is, as I say, pretty consistent. Uh, people want flexibility. They want work that fits in with their increasingly complex lives and with caring, and particularly older people want more flexible forms of work, younger people as well. So they want flexibility. They want two-way flexibility. Two-way flexibility is great, where the organisation is flexible, the individual is flexible. What's bad is one-way flexibility, where the flexibility all lies on the side of the employer, not on the side of the employee. So people want flexibility. But beyond that, what do they want? They want Meaning. They want a sense that their job is meaningful. That's what came back over and over and over again, that work is meaningful, that there is a purpose to it, that at the end of the day you think you've done something useful. And that's not just, by the way, about lower paid work. That's about all work. A guy called David Graeber wrote a piece called Bullshit Jobs, 
And he wrote it because it was based on someone who wrote to him as a corporate lawyer in New York who said, I'm incredibly rich, incredibly successful, and I think if I fell under a bus tomorrow, it would make any difference to anybody. In fact, I think the world would probably be a better place. <laughs> and that was one of the most retweeted blogs ever written because so many people could relate to that idea. So meaning matters. Autonomy matters. People want to feel that they have choices in work, that they are not just cogs in a machine, that whether that's that they are trusted to make judgments or whether they've got a voice in the decisions that are made in their workplace, that they have some say. And then mastery, if that's not a sexist term, but, but you know what I mean by it, that sense that I'm doing a job and getting better at it, that I am learning something, that I uh, have a sense of pride in the thing that I'm doing and that I am putting myself in a position where I could do something else beyond that. I could do a, another job, a different job. I'm learning something. I'm, I'm developing myself. And then teamwork is also very important to people. People feel that they, to be part of a team really matters. And actually, don't underestimate that. You know, if you look at, for example, uh, what we know about soldiers who show incredible bravery in war, and you ask them why they did it, they will maybe talk about the nation and they'll talk about the war, but they'll overwhelmingly talk about the fact that they did it because of the group of soldiers, the, the team that they are part of and the loyalty they had. So, so to finish, I, I, I'd say this, that I hope the review that I've done will make a difference. I hope that the, some of the very kind of technical, specific, nitty-gritty things that I'll recommend will make a difference. I hope that I will, have ended, I will have created a debate about the things that we need to change, those kind of systemic things we need to change if we're going to have a good work economy. But most of all, most of all, uh, I hope this. I hope that I will introduce into our mind, into our bloodstream, into our political discourse, the idea that there is no reason why any job, every job, can't be a job which gives people those things which you know give them that satisfaction. That there is no reason why we can't have an economy uh, of good work. I believe it's possible and Whatever else happens when we launch next week, the thing I will judge myself on and the thing you can judge me on is whether or not after we've published that conversation about good work grows in our society. Thank you.